And yet your blood and your sacrifice has provided a way for us to be made right with you. It is a blessing to just be able to be here and, and to sing and pray and God now to read your word. We can only do that through the grace that you so freely give us. And Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and lives this morning, that you would work and move and Lord, that none of us here would have any sort of barriers or anything blocking you off from our life. But Lord, we would, as a group of believers, say that, God, we, we want you to come into our hearts today. We want to open ourselves up completely and wholly to you. And we ask that you would work and move and do mighty things in our lives. And Father, we pray for our our church family who's not able to be here today. Lord, as always, we lift up Miss Pat, Miss Helen. Pray for Dan and Rita. Pray for Ralph and Kathy, Ted and Inga. Lord, we just ask that you would touch our people who aren't able to be here. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in them just as you move in us here in this place. Jesus, we love you today. We thank you so much, and we ask all this in your precious holy and beautiful name. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, it's great to see you guys again. Our youngest daughter, Hattie, has struck with biological warfare again. So she's been sick this week and she's better. So I just... I'm to be. But I've often heard people say, you know, well, like Jesus, his sacrifice covers past, present, and future sins. And, and that's very true. But before we even get started today, I want to share with you something that's on my heart. And you're going to see this in a lot of the passages that we're going to read this morning. Got a lot of scripture, a lot of different passages of scripture. So if you're taking notes, keep up with it. It'll be on the screen, but keep up with it because it's a lot of good stuff. But it supports what I'm about to tell you. Is that the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ does not give us the freedom to just live in sin. And I've heard people who claim to be Christians who would say, well, like, Jesus forgives me of my sins, past, present, future sins. So they'll cling to one Bible verse of what that says. And they'll say, so I can live in sin, and Jesus has forgiven me for that already. And it's like, that's not true. That's not what Scripture says. So this, the, the, these sermons are not giving you a license to sin. It's actually the exact opposite of that. And if you have any questions on that, just go home, read Romans chapter 6. Paul does a great job writing to the church in Rome. There's a lot of writings in the New Testament where the apostles and, and the authors are dealing with people who are claiming to be Christians and still living in sin. And so this morning, we're talking about sin, because even though you may be saved this morning, there may be a chance that there is sin in your life. And even if you're sitting here and you, you don't have sin that you're acutely aware of at the moment, 
as believers in Christ, as servants of Christ, we need to have the humble attitude of things like of people like King David, who in the Psalm wrote, he said, Lord, if I have sin in my heart that I'm unaware of, reveal it to me so I can confess and repent of that sin. And so we need to have the attitude in our hearts that, that even if there's not sin that we're aware of, that we say, Jesus, I want to be so close with you. I want to walk with you. I want to do everything that your word's calling me to do, to even have the attitude, if there's something in my heart and life that I'm not aware of, reveal it to me so that I can confess and repent of that sin. And before we can deal with what to do with sin when other people sins against you and how you move forward with sin, we just really have to start with the basics and talk about what do we do with our own sin. Because you can't do anything about anybody else's sin until you deal with the sin in your own life. Is that fair? It's true. We've got to deal with sin in our life. So today's focus passage is 1 John chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. It's short, but it's right to the point. I think it's exactly what we need today. And John writes to these people because, again, there's this attitude of people who are claiming to be believers in Christ who are still struggling with sin. And so if you're sitting here today and you're claiming to be a believer in Christ and you are struggling with sin, I just want you to know, like, keep your head up, people. Keep praying, keep seeking the Lord because you're not the only one. Like most of the New Testament was written because everybody who was putting their faith in Christ were still struggling with sin. You with me today? That should give us a hope that, that we're not lost, that we're just working, like Christ is working and moving in us, and we have a calling in our life to continue to follow him. So let's read together verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. Pretty cut and dry, right? So that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. Now, if you're sitting here today, we should really understand how amazing this passage of Scripture is. Because what it means is that it gives us the understanding, it should give you the understanding, that even as a believer in Christ, if you're still struggling with sin, if, if there's a, a sin that you've, you've dealt with or something that you committed a long time ago that you still feel guilt about, to know that Jesus Christ loves you. He died to forgive you of your sin. And if you do sin, if you sin that you have someone, Jesus, who sits at the Father's right hand and pleads on your behalf. That makes the good news better news. You with me? It, It gives you hope because it doesn't mean that whenever you're sitting here today and you ask Jesus to come in your heart and then after you've become saved and you become a Christian, that if you do fall into temptation and sin, that it's over. You failed. You're no longer a Christian hang it up, walk away, try something else. It tells us the exact opposite. That there's a process here that Jesus Christ comes into your heart, he saves you, he covers you with your blood, but they, with his blood, but there's, there's this understanding of continuing to walk with Christ so that you can grow and understanding that if sin enters in, because at times it does, because are you perfect? No, you're not perfect. Surprise. You're not perfect. Jesus knows that you weren't perfect. He knows that you're never really going to be perfect. And so if you do sin, that there's a way to deal with that. But as believers, we're called to deal with it. We're not called to sweep it under the rug. We're not called to ignore it. We're not called to make excuses for it. We're called to deal with it. So point number one today is the goal is not to sin. Now, I want to share this with you because Scripture affirms this over and over again in various books, especially in the New Testament, various books. The goal has always been not to sin. Even when God presented Moses with the terms of the covenant in Exodus, the book of Exodus, and he, he gives all these laws. And, he, and then he even in the, in the laws, he gives all these things of when you sin, this is what you should do. This is how you make atonement for those sins. The goal has always been not to sin. And we need to understand that in our lives today. So if someone's ever just like poured poison in your ear and said, well, it's okay. We're just sinners and we sin every day. That is not what Christ has called us to. 
Jesus Christ did not die on the cross and suffer and bleed and die to save you from your sins for you to keep on sinning. That's taking advantage of God's grace and mercy. And there's a lot of passages of Scripture that strongly warn against the consequences of that. Romans chapter 6, one of those chapters. Make sure you read it. It's a great chapter. But the goal has always been not to sin. And I want to share with you today, there's a big difference between living a lifestyle of sin versus falling into sin and temptation. Because you go back and you look, look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin, but if you do. So there's the understanding in this moment of we're not perfect. There's always the possibility of sin because we have free will. We have the ability to choose sin at any moment. We have the ability to choose God at any moment. And it's not when we sin. Think about the play on words in that. He doesn't say, but when you sin. He says, if you sin. There should not be an attitude in our heart to think of, well, we're going to sin, so it's just a matter of when. Like, no, if you sin, because the goal is not to sin. But if you do, you have someone pleading on your behalf, which is great. But we have to be very careful in our attitude as we follow the Lord not to take advantage of the person who sits at God's right hand and does plead on your behalf. You have to remember, we talked last week was Easter Sunday. It's like the day that we celebrate Jesus bled and died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the grave. He conquered death in the grave. He ascended to heaven. He sent us the Holy Spirit to empower us to do all the things He's called us to do because He knows that we are not perfect and that we're not able. And we need Him to do all the things that He's called us to do. But the goal is not to sin. And then John expounds on this in chapter 3, verse 6. So read this with me. He says, anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. If you're living in Christ, John's very clear about this, of there's an understanding of you will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. And so I want to share with you today this whole attitude and this, this mindset of it may not even necessarily be that that you don't know Christ. It might just be the understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. That there could be a, a, a complete gap there of just understanding who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for you. And, and I'm, I'm sitting here today and this year, it'll be my 24 years that I've been saved. And I can tell you as a believer, <clears throat> there has been times where sin has been in my life in these past 24 years, and I've had to deal with that. But it's not this attitude of habitual sin, of this lifestyle of sin. And I don't understand how anyone who truly knows who Jesus Christ is and what he did for them on that cross could just continue on living in the sin that he bled and died to free them from. I mean, it's not that Jesus just died to forgive you of your sins, but he came to free you from the bondage of sin. And there's so many passages of Scripture that just expound on this idea of it's not just about going to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, and then we're done. But there's a calling on our life to pursue Jesus with all that we are, to serve him, to serve others. To, to, to come out of the world, to, to lay our life down, to take up our cross, to follow him. There's so much more that goes with being a follower of Christ than just asking for forgiveness of sin. And the goal is not to sin. John talks about it. And you got to understand, there's a big difference between living a lifestyle of sin and then as you are walking in your relationship with the Lord, you fall into sin and temptation. Because sometimes we do. Because what happens most of the time when we get saved, God reveals to us a lot of things in our life that are wrong, and we, we, we remove ourselves from those things. We come out of that, that lifestyle. We separate ourselves from friends or relationships, and we begin to follow the Lord. And so a lot of people will call a lot of those things sins of the youth. Like, you know, you may not be out living a lifestyle of sin like a lot of young people are living in and the things that they're doing. But at the same time, we have to 
be open and honest as believers that there's a lot of other sins out there than just going out, getting drunk, partying, having sex, doing all the crazy stuff. Like, there's a lot of other sins in that. You know, Scripture, New Testament, constantly talks about slander, gossip, like just not respecting authority, like very simple things that a lot of times we as people, we don't really pay a whole lot of attention to, but we're called to come out of so many difference of, of all sin. And there's a lot of things that, that the scriptures tell us that if you participate in these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. And so just even being here today and just understanding and reminding yourself, okay, there's a high calling on my life. Jesus Christ bled and died for you. He paid a high price. He gave up his life for you to be saved, to come out of the world. The goal has always been for you not to sin, but just in case you do, if you do, there's a way to bring you back in good standing with the Lord. He has provided that for you. So this is not a matter of like, oh man, Pastor James is just trying to throw the guilt trip on us this morning. He's trying to make us feel like garbage. Like, no, I'm not trying to make you feel like garbage. I'm trying to get you to the point where your relationship with Christ is better when you leave here than what it was when you came in. And if there's sin in your life, you can't be as close to Christ as you are called to be. Sin separates us from Christ. The goal has always been not to sin. Point number two. But we do have this high priest. If you sin, you have this high priest. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, it says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Before I move on, you know, you need to understand that the entire book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who had put their faith in Christ. But they began to experience a lot of persecution from their own family members. Family members and the synagogues, they were casting them out. If they put their faith in Christ, they would cast them out. They would not associate with them anymore. And they would kind of get to this point where they were alone. And then life gets hard. <coughs> and then all of a sudden they start renouncing their faith. But the author of Hebrews is saying, look, if you've put your faith in Christ, you need to cling to this faith. So for us this morning, as we're talking about this, I just want to share with you today that if you put your faith in Christ, and then if you sin, not when you sin, but if you sin, don't just give up. Don't just throw your hands up and say, well, I can't do this. Like, I'm not perfect. I, I'm never going to be what God's called me to be like. No, you're not perfect. No, you are never going to be what God wants you to be. But through Christ, all things are possible. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be empowered to do all the things that God has called you to do. But on your own, you can't do that. And this is why we need all of Scripture. We don't just need to cling to one verse that makes us feel better about ourselves, but we need all Scripture to cling to so we know exactly what God requires of us. And so when you look at what the author of Hebrews is saying, hold firmly to what you believe. You need to cling to this. And in verse 15 he says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And so Jesus sits at God's right hand, and he pleads on your behalf. Again, this is not like, this is not the sermon to make you feel terrible about yourself. This is a sermon to remind you that as a believer in Christ, there's hope. There's hope, and there's, it's possible to be who God has called you to be. He's done everything to make it possible for you. And if you sin, it's not over. But you have a high priest who sits at God's right hand and pleads on your behalf if you do sin. Not when you sin, because it's not a matter of, well, I'm just going to sin. It's a matter of if you sin, it should not be a lifestyle. It should be something that sometimes we're just not at our best. And so if you sin, you have Jesus who sits at God's right hand. He pleads on your behalf. And think about this. He understands your weaknesses. You think about temptation. Sin and temptation is a really funny thing. It's like, how many of you would be mortified this morning 
if we put like the things in your life that you're tempted with or the sins in your life that you've committed in the past or like you've even thought about committing, how many of you would be mortified if we just like put that up on the screen with your name beside it this morning? It would be, it would be, oh my gosh, I'd probably never come back. And what's awesome is, is that Jesus sits at God's right hand and he understands our weaknesses because he's experienced all these things just as you and I did. And, and you know, let, let's just think about Jesus' own temptation. We don't get a whole lot of this. You know, we get like three things that Jesus was tempted with. But when you think about um, that, that whole aspect of let, let's just take Jesus whenever Satan takes him up to the mountains and he shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. All right? Very simple. We don't think a whole lot about it, but Satan says, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth for their mind to give. And it's like, oh, yeah, he, he resisted that temptation. But it's like, remind yourself that Jesus was tempted by that. Now, I don't know about you guys, but anytime I'm tempted, it's because I want to do it. Like, if you tempted me with a bowl of mayonnaise, that's not very tempting. That's gross. If you tempted me with a bowl of ice cream, you probably got me. If it's something that I want to do, like temptation is something that we want to do. Like it's, there's something within us for whatever reason. And we can't explain it. Like we don't know why. For every person in this room, our temptations are very different according to who you are and how God has created you, things in your life that you've been exposed to and experienced. And so temptations could look very differently from one person to the next. But even to remind yourself that Jesus was tempted to bow down and worship Satan to receive the things of the world. He understands what it's like whenever you are going through temptation. And he sits at God's right hand, he pleads on your behalf, and he reminds God, he says, look, let's be merciful with them because what they're going through is extremely difficult. And we might be ashamed of our sins, we might be ashamed of the things we're tempted by, but it's extremely difficult to refrain from those things when we're in the moment, and whatever it is within us desires that. And Jesus understands. So we have this high priest, and in verse 16 he says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. And so this morning, when you think about, like, if you sin, if there's sin in your life, you know, we've talked about this many times, but one of our first instincts whenever we sin is to hide from God, to hide from the church, to hide from, from other Christians. It's like we pull away from that because it reminds us of our sin. Adam and Eve, first thing they did when they sinned, hid from God in the garden. But... The author in this moment is saying, look, if you do sin, do not hide from God, but come boldly to his throne. And when you sin and that guilt's in your life and that shame is there, there's something within you that just wants to hide and you just want to like kick yourself and just wallow in your shame. And you, the last thing you want to do is to have a spiritual moment because you know, and it just slaps you in the face. But the author in this moment is saying, look, if you sin, you come boldly before the throne of God. Because there's a calling in your life to deal with this junk. You cannot leave sin undealt with. You cannot leave these things that we allow to come in our life at various moments to be unchecked. God has provided everything that we need to deal with them and do what he's called us to. So point three. Jesus atones for our sins. And again, this is one of those things like, well, duh, we've talked about this last week on Easter Sunday. You've talked about it already. But guys, we really need to remind ourselves that if we sin, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is enough to cover anything that you could ever do. And we love to talk about the grace and mercy of Jesus, right? How many of you like to be forgiven of sin? 
We always love the grace and mercy of Christ. We love the idea that we have a God who loves us and in spite of our many failures that he's willing to forgive us anyway. Well, I mean, think about something as crazy as murder or rape or child abuse or whatever it is that you could list. You know, there's certain things in our life that we look at and we're like, that's terrible. I just don't even understand how someone else could do those things. And I hope that none of you in here have ever done any of those things. I hope and pray you haven't. But we need to cling to this understanding that if the grace of God is sufficient enough to forgive even the vilest of sin, it's sufficient enough to forgive your sin. There's nothing in your life that you have ever done that God cannot forgive you of. He has not already made atonement for. And so from the worst sin to the simplest or, you know, the, uh, whatever you want, however you want to refer to it, just the most minute sins that you could think of, you need to understand this morning, like sin is sin. And sin creates separation between us and God. And you know that we've already said it, our first instinct is to flee from God, but Scripture calls us to come back boldly to His throne. And so we need to deal with that sin, whether it's like small, what you would consider a small sin or some kind of great big sin. The wonderful thing this morning is to know that Jesus Christ has already done everything that needs to be done to make atonement for it. Now it's up to you as to whether or not you're going to seek out that grace and that mercy. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, <coughs> Paul writes to the church in Galatia. He says, Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned. And it was all part of God's plan that Jesus would do this. In order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live, all glory to God forever and ever. Amen. And so you have to go to Jesus. He's the only way. He's the only way to receive that atonement for sin. There's nothing you could do to make up for it. There's no gesture. Like you, you could go to someone that you've sinned against or you've hurt, and you could ask them for forgiveness, or you could do something to try to make it up. But in reality, there's nothing you can do to get atonement for sin other than go to Jesus Christ. As he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And point number four, last one. We have to confess and repent. And this may sound silly. It may sound like a dust statement. But I think as Protestant American churches... We don't do this very well. We do not confess and repent very well. Like we, we love to cling to passages of Scripture that almost gives us the freedom to continue on in sin. We love to listen to passages of Scripture. We can just say, well, my, <clears throat> my faith is personal. You know, I'll handle this between me and the Lord. I don't need other believers. Or I don't need to go to church. Or You know, we, we love to just make all these statements and listen to what other people say rather than really focusing on what Scripture says about the topic of sin and what it is that you and I are supposed to do with sin. But as a believer, you're called by God to confess and to repent of sin. And it's not just a matter of, oh, I asked Jesus to come into my heart 30 years ago. It's like, yeah, like, so what? What's happened since then? You look in the book of Hebrews, all those people were denying their faith and returning back to the former law. And that's why the author was saying, you have a high priest who pleads on your behalf. Cling to him. And for us to sit here today and understand, like, we got to confess and repent. What does that mean? How many times in church have you ever heard someone get up and confess sin? And yet, Scripture tells us that we are to confess our sins to one another. And you don't see it happening. And when you think about repenting, what does repenting mean? The simplest definition of repent is to turn away. 
that you're going in one direction and to turn and go in the other direction. You go back to Galatians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. And it says, in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live, Jesus came to save you from sin and this evil world that we live in. Like there, there should be this very intentional moment and these intentional choices in your life where we're constantly turning away from things in order to move towards Christ. And the realization that we can choose stuff in this life that we may not necessarily think or necessarily sin for, they're not all that bad because a lot of other people are doing it, but in reality, there's a direction towards Christ and there's a direction away from Christ, and we're called, constantly called, to turn away from the world, to turn away from sin, to take up our cross, and to follow Christ. Confessing and repenting is not just something that we say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Because it's easy to just say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. So many people pray that prayer. But how many people are willing to confess it and share that sin with others? Because have you ever had to say something out loud you didn't want to say? It's one of the most difficult things in the world, like to have to like look someone in the eye that you love and tell them something that you know is going to hurt them or something that you know is like going to be a problem or something that you're dealing with internally and you think, and, and a lot of times the staff know this, I'm an I'm a external thinker, and so a lot of times I would just like think out loud and say it because when you say something out loud, it becomes real. As long as it's in here, it's not reality. But once you say it and it comes out, then it's reality. And then a lot of times you'll understand the weight that it carries once you say it. And confession is literally just the act of saying it out loud and acknowledging, love, this is what I've done. And perhaps some of you in this room or some people who are watching or listening later on really just need to look at another human being in the face and confess your sin to them because you need to see the reaction on their face for it to set in reality of how much this does not need to be a part of your life. But repenting is turning away from whatever it is that you've been doing. And so many people come and ask Jesus to forgive them. And Scripture says, oh, it's like a dog returning to its vomit. It's like we, we as people, like we'll just return. We'll return to that sin over and over again. It's like a dog returning to his vomit. But to repent and to turn away, not many people truly turn away from their sins. As you're sitting here today, I just want to challenge you to be willing to have this attitude that's different. To do something that no one else has done. And you don't have to do it because other people do it. You could be one of the first ones to do it. It's a lot different than last week because last week's altar call was easy. You know, there's a lot of different things that we talked about that you could have went to the altar for. But today, like it's, it's different because we're talking about sin. And man, if I ask you to come down to the altar this morning, the first thought in your mind is going to be, man, if I come down to the altar, then everyone's going to know that I got sin in my life, and that's going to be embarrassing. It's going to be terrible. They'll be so disappointed in me. Well, let's think about it from a theological perspective. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. It's no surprise that we're sinners. There's not a single person in this room, if they're truly a believer in Christ, at some point in their life has not had to ask forgiveness of sin. There's, not a, there's never been a time where someone who's followed Jesus has not had to acknowledge sin in their life and to confess it and to turn away from it. And then you look at something like Luke chapter 15, verse 7 where it says, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. And so this morning, I think it's important to understand that as a believer, it's not 
<coughs> this matter of God wants us to be perfect, or I mean, you know, He calls us not to sin. The goal is not to sin. It's not this idea that He expects you to be perfect, but no, He's actually made so many things available to us because He knew that we're not perfect. And if there's sin that is in your life, it's not a surprise. Because it's not the first time that a Christian has had to deal with sin. You look at the New Testament, the entire New Testament was written because the New Testament churches were struggling in sin. And so all the scripture from the New Testament deal with people who needed to address sin. And this morning as Haley comes and she plays, I just want to encourage you as a believer to not be ashamed But know in your heart that, man, if you, if you don't address this, if you don't get this right between you and the Lord, then you're just making the problem worse. You're keeping it going. But to know that Christ died to set you free, Jesus Christ came to free you from the bondage of sin, to free you from this world. There's nothing better than, than to be set free. We've all sinned. Like I said, there's been times in my life since I've been saved that I've had to address sin in my life. And so this morning, if you have sin in your life, don't be ashamed. I mean, it's not something that we want to brag about. We don't want to glorify our sin. But at the same time, it needs to be dealt with. As the Gospel of Luke says, Jesus said, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than 99 others who have strayed away. There's joy in confession and repentance. And it's not just for you as an individual, because there, there should be great joy when you confess and repent. But I mean, like, there's a party going on in heaven over someone who confesses and repents and returns to their father. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's something that we should celebrate. The fact that God has spoke to you, the fact that God has revealed something to you, and that he wants to do something new in you. But as long as the sin's there, you can't move forward. You can't be who God's called you to be can't serve him how he's called you to serve him. Sin hinders us from that. So this morning, if you got something you need to address, the altars are open. I invite you to come pray. Haley's going to play for a few minutes. You're welcome to come.
Father God, we just want to say thank you for the opportunity to come today and just sharing your word and just to be reminded of what it is that you ask us of. Lord, I pray that you would speak into our hearts. Lord, if there's anybody who are still sitting in their chair who just can't make themselves get up, God, I just ask that you would give them strength and courage. And Lord, you, you hear us where we are. You know that you know what's going on in our heart right now. But Lord, there's something about confessing. There's something about making it real. Making it where other people see and know. This gives us a little bit of accountability. Father, I pray that you would work and move. That you would heal hearts and you would touch lives. And Lord, if there's sin, that you would forgive it. That these people would seek your face. Lord, we thank you so much for having everything already set up and done so that we could receive forgiveness from you. All we have to do is seek it. Jesus, I pray that you would touch our hearts and lives, that you would guide us as we leave this place. I pray that we would serve you and honor you And Lord, that we would live according to your will and your ways. That we would turn away from the things of the world. And we would seek Christ with all that we are. 